Yeah, so uh, Gary Caulfield, did you know, I uh, CEO of Exlam Australia uh, for th- just over three years, uh, kind of overseeing the uh, expansion out of New Zealand and the, uh, the build for the new factory and commissioning of the new factory and, and the ex- conversion of Exlam from a, a product manufacturer into a, you know, a solution provider. Uh, post post Exlam, I uh, did a number of uh, bits of consulting for New Zealand government uh, around off-site fabrication and timber. And uh, I suppose in it, I moved to New Zealand in 2004 and I've been involved in uh, off-site fabrication primarily since 2004. So been a very long time since I've been on a traditional construction site and obviously uh, Timber fits right into uh, the off-site space, and in previous roles, we you know we did do a number of mass timber projects b- before before mass timber was the sexy word that we know it is today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you're heading up the you're the project director now of of Asia's largest CLT project. Uh, tell me if I'm going to pronounce it incorrectly, but Nanyang Technological University Academic Building. South, can you tell us a bit about the, the details of this project and why they uh, chose timber for it? Yeah, so the, uh, the, we, we shorten it to the NTU ABS and, and more, more than often than not, the NTU. Uh, NTU were one of the leaders in, uh, in Asia Pacific in uh, mass timber. They, are, they were the client for the WAVE project. Mm which is the, uh, in the same campus where the ABS building is. It's a uh, sports gymnasium, large freeform roof gymnasium with showers and other bits and pieces, but it's very, very big building. That was Singapore's first mass timber building supplied by Binderhawks uh, for the CLT and Glulam and erected by a local, uh, erected by a local roofing contractor, uh, believe it or not. Uh, Singapore has had a large push towards uh, many different types of off-site fabrication in the last seven or eight years, which is primarily as a result of uh, overcrowding in the workers' dormitories, shortage of of semi-skilled labour in Singapore, uh, and a reduction in the availability of land. So they've pushed towards the uptake of of off-site technology. Very, very uh, concrete is very, very popular. Uh, 3D volumetric boxes, uh, prefabricated steelwork is popular. Light gauge steel has not gained a foothold yet, but that is changing. And timber, you know, timber, they started to push with NTU the wave. Since then, there have been possibly half a dozen school buildings uh, where they've done the school roof and, and recently com- completed uh, Singapore Management University, SMU, SMUX, uh, did a number of floors. Uh, so it, it, there are grants available from the Singapore government if you can prove productivity gains. Uh, perhaps the rest of the world's governments should listen to that. Uh, <laughs> so significant grants to help get the market off the ground and help compensate for some of the testing and some of those unforeseen costs uh, when a new technology is coming through. Uh, so the NTU building uh, fitted in with what they're doing on the uh, timber front. Uh, they have just recently completed a significantly large precast concrete building called The Hive, which has been winning a number of awards. And we are in the shadow of, of The Hive. Uh, the, the Hive is directly north from us. Uh, so it fits in with some of the other stuff they've done. Uh, they've gone kind of out to the world for leading designers, taking uh, Toyo Ito in Japan and uh, RSP locally to come up with the design. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And Oricon. Uh, and David, I'd like to ask you about uh, if you were to focus on the most important aspects for designers so up front you're going to have a design that's going to cause as minimal headaches as possible for the delivery team uh, what advice would you have for designers out there putting a singapore perspective on it would be what we call the the, the singapore the singapore factor which is um speaking specifically about into you is i guess knowing 
knowing your client's requirement and the government requirements here. It is so, so different doing this job here. Things that you would take for granted with Eurocode or Code New Zealand or Australia, everything here has to be proven, tested. Like, for example, even putting a column base on the other day, you've got a team of about five people inspecting, checking drill talks, checking screw threads, checking everything under the sun. And that has been the same since day one of this project. And it's probably caught everyone out by surprise. So I guess from a design perspective in a, what would you call this, a, a country that's just starting to get used to timber, is do your homework with what's, with what's required. You know, um, Yeah, that's sort of specific to Singapore. Um, mm. I think, Adam, I, I would say, reiterate, uh, you know, you got to use, you got to pick the right team, you've got to use the right product in the right place for the right price. That's possibly more of a generic global statement. Uh, you know, pick the right team. David, you know, we, we have had a number of challenges in Singapore because this is the first time a number of people have used timber. I, I would not, when you're building the world's largest timber building, I would not recommend people who don't use, don't know timber. That can be the same, you know, less, less risk with building a small house. I am. Uh, Pick the right team, uh, pick the right supply partners. You know, we have a vast, uh, we have a vast array of, I think, 10 people from 10 different UK, Austria, Germany, Italy, Singapore, Sweden, Vancouver, Taiwan, Australia. Put that one in last. Uh, we've got a vast array of people working on the project who are all the best at what they do. Mm. Uh, we're picking the right product. Uh, your seminar or uh, uh, webcast yeah. on uh, durability a number of weeks ago, we, we listened intently in Singapore uh, to all the Ds around, around durability. Um, it's a very misunderstood product by people who don't use it all the time. You know, we would perceive you know, use hardwood glue lamb in a certain place, use softwood glue lamb somewhere else, use CLT in a certain place, and certain places don't use CLT. We're actually using CLT for a significant part of the externally exposed structure. Mm. Uh, something new, uh, whether it's still there in 50 years or not, time will tell uh, but use the right product in the right in the right place and and you've got to that then should give you the right pli the right price because we have a uh, concrete cores uh, we have concrete stairs uh, we have a concrete parapet that sits in between the columns uh, we have a we have a timber roof with a screed so we've got a, a, a very simplistic mix of material but getting the balance between using the right material in the right place should hopefully give you the right price. Yeah, and you mentioned getting the team in in early. How important do you think it is to lock in a supplier at the very start? Because some, you know, some developers and projects going into Tim for the first time, they want as much competition as possible. So it's a balance between keeping competition up to drive down costs from a developer's point of view, but at the same time the supplier's got a lot of value to add at the start. So can you talk about that, the balance between these two? Yeah, look, I think uh, obviously the uh, developers, quantity surveyors, project managers do like tension, do like competition. You've got to weigh that up against what you're getting on a, you know, the reality is with a competitive tender, everybody's trying to figure out how to give you the cheapest price at 12 o'clock on a Friday when the tender is opened. Uh, with the early contractor engagement, the ECI process, you're trying to extract the value that the subcontractor or the supplier can give. I think possibly misunderstood with mass timber is that the, the bottom of the food chain are the manufacturers and the manufacturers are willing to engage and provide advice uh, through the process. There are other places to get, the, get advice like the mid-rise team uh, with yourselves, but the manufacturers will tell you how to engage. I, like any new product, there is a new process. Uh, timber is not concrete. Timber is not steel. Uh, the supply chain operates different. The European supply chain is very strict, very stringent on how they do things, and possibly quite inflexible 
as to how they do things. Uh, that you know, one of the issues we face in Singapore is a very mature concrete market, and the reality is labour is cheap. Rush, rush, rush. Pour concrete incorrectly, jackhammer it out that night. Repour the concrete the next day. Trying to ex trying to uh, explain to them that we cannot deal with timber that needs. You know, I have a six month manufacture, six week manufacture time and six week shipping time, as well as possibly say six weeks for shop drawings. So I've got 18 week lead time from Europe for a material. You have to get it right before you order it. And the only way to do that is through engagement with the suppliers. You may not wish to engage with a main contractor or you may not wish to engage with a subcontractor who can still add value, but you can engage at the bottom rung of the ladder with the supplier, that can tell you the ins and outs of things. I think one of the main reasons for doing that in timber is nobody uh, fully understands uh, the cost of CNC work and the cost of shipping. Fresh air is expensive, you know, $100 a cube in a container, $100 of fresh air is $100 that you don't get back. Uh, and CNC, CNC machining, you know, you know, at say 17 euros, uh, 17, 26, at 26 dollars a lineal meter. If you, you know, we have we have three and a half kilometers of joints on our building. If we do something wrong in the design phase or make a, a, a wrong assumption when we have such significant quantities, three and a half thousand lineal meters at 23 or 24 dollars a lineal meter adds up very, very quickly. Find that information out early. Yeah, love it. And uh, I've got a question for yeah, David or Gary, you might like to answer this, but looking at the renders, it's all exposed timber, which is looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, obviously, there's a, a lot of effort would have gone into the fire engineering uh, approach. Can you talk a little bit about yeah the fire engineering and any testing maybe if it, if it was necessary and, and how you achieved it? Yeah, so I mean, Oricon would have led that from the early stage of the project, but from a fire perspective, almost all of our timber is exposed. Exposed ceilings as well. All of our members are fully exposed, all four sides, all three sides. Our fire rating is 94 minutes as opposed to 90. And I can't even begin to explain the pain that has come with those extra four minutes <laughs> as opposed to just 90. <laughs> Trying to get a lab to write 94 minutes as opposed to REI of 90 is borderline impossible. And because of that fire build up, we have, we have a few things that have become a lot more difficult because of it. Our, our typical slab, a 160 slab, is not a standard build up. Our outer layers are 42.5 millimeters just to get our glue line out of that first sort of stage of burning, which Again, I, I don't know that I don't know the number off the top of my head, but across forty thousand squares, that is, uh, you know, that that probably would have added a significant factor to the just the timber cost itself. Um, from a testing perspective, a lot of it is linked to the PLS in Singapore, so the product listing scheme. So any material that is being brought into Singapore has to reach a certain fire fire standard, and those standards aren't necessarily designed for timber. So basically. In our case, for this PLS, you've got people from um, certification bodies flying over to Europe to VHAG and Story Enzo, inspecting the factories, inspecting all their quality standards. We've had to do fire tests on slabs, columns, beams as just a material. Char rate checks. From a connection perspective, we've also had to test our our other connectors are just concealed, and being cast aluminium, the local authorities here had some serious concerns around aluminium heating up so we had to do fire tests on our beam column connections and they've all performed really well and i guess you know a lot of these podcasts we talk about fire theory and things and it, it's not something to be nervous i guess most like you don't hear about too many fire tests going the wrong way that you want but allowing for that cost and even the organization it's um yeah it's, it's a mammoth task and we're still still going through it after what easily a year now to try and get certified. Yeah. yeah, there is a lot of trepidation, I think, with builders about how much fire testing yeah. is going to be needed for a project. And there's a lot of uncertainty there. So they, they put a risk premium and just allow for a lot of costs in that. 
the amount of tests on you know all those items you just mentioned i feel like it's gets tested on almost each project so so gary do you think it can get to a point where and this might be a role for wood solutions in just um consolidating all the tests but at the same time everyone's worried about ip so what, what are your thoughts gary on on fire testing going forward and it's use? fire testing and, uh, and ip uh, you know look my uh, opinion of ip has always been that i'm bound to have another good idea so i'm not too worried about my ip uh, a number of years ago i um, andrew dunn led uh, an industry uh, series of acoustic testing uh, with KLH, Stora, Binder, Myers, and XLAM, uh, I think it was at Auckland University Test Lab, on the premise that all the data would be shared and freely available with industry. What a great idea. Uh, what a good benchmark for all the competitors to understand how the product compares with everyone else. The industry got free access to that acoustic data. Yes, it was all given back to the uh, to the manufacturers to do stuff with, but you know why can't we do something like that with fire? That test program, yes, uh, it cost. Uh, I think we did over two hundred. We did over two hundred scenarios. What a great lot of data! Why can't we industry get together and do something with fire? Because the the you know the reality is, as David says, yes, we can mix up. Uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't be specifying CLT with a 10 mil outer layer or a 15 mil outer layer, we have this very strange 42.5 mil outer layer, uh, as opposed to the European norm being 40. Um, I certainly think that uh, that, you know, we, we know the char rate is very, very, what we know about timber is it's very, very predictable and it behaves the way we think it would behave unlike unlike some of, some other materials. Um, so. What IP is there around? Because we're all buying spruce or pine or fir. We're all buying the same materials. We're all gluing them together. Yes, that there there are new glues like the Henkel HBX with some fire properties. Uh, that is up to each individual manufacturer which glue they want to put in. But it's becoming more and more and more common. Everybody's heading the same way. Uh, for that, so yeah, perhaps it is something uh, you know for Wood Solutions to propose some industry fire test because you are right, we're all testing the same thing on on every project. I suppose the piece of our, uh, the piece of IP uh, are those uh, further opinions on different thicknesses and different combinations. Those are th those could be you know held, but why can't we all get together and share that inf information? It can only help grow the size of the pie that we all have a share in. Is, is my is my own opinion. We've certainly uh, done tests for the beams, done tests for the columns, done tests for the connections. Um, we haven't had to do too much to the CLT in way of fire because Stora Enzo already have a lot of their fire data readily available. But uh, you know, I we have certainly shared the pixel fire test information. I've shared it with a number of engineers in Australia, New Zealand, America, and Europe. Because well, why not? <laughs> Yeah. it's useful information for other people to have the same goes for our, um, our material testing in Singapore so um, I think from the tender orders it was supposed to test three three D lamb shear and finger joint tests per 40 cube of timber we've got which is just a generic spec that's thrown out there we've got 13,000 cubes nearly so that itself is nearly a million dollars of testing mm. and so trying to work those things down. And again, with that sort of testing, we don't have to do that much anymore, but we have to do, I think um, VHAG said the other day, by the time we're done, we would have done 7,000 DLAM tests on this project. And we have to replicate a lot of this testing that has been done in factories in Europe, exactly the same test here, just to meet the, the I guess, the local regulations that they have a little bit of skepticism about testing overseas. And so we are repeating them here. And I guess what we're trying to do is once we get that data, we might as well send it back to the to VHAG to store it to Rotterblast. We're testing probably a thousand screws here. We might as well at least share that back with them. Yeah. yeah. And this, the silly thing is, the fire, like fire testing wise, we tested a beam, I think a 560 by 400 beam. I know it's another project in Singapore literally did exactly the same test. Uh -huh. The, the, the same day or the, the yeah. next day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of the unique things on the fire engineering mm -hmm. uh, approaches, obviously, the, the, the building is sprinklered 
uh, from the 3D walkthroughs I've sent you, you see it's, it's a very, very open space. Uh, one of the uh, design uh, features that Toyo Ito from Japan wanted uh, was they wanted the, the beam section to match the column section. So our beams are very, very much over-engineered uh, from a fire and from a structural perspective. And there was a certain look around the exposed edge of the building they required. So you could perhaps think that the 160 slab is, is over-engineered for uh, beams which are running at kind of three and a half meter centers. So we do have a lot of extra material, but it's to achieve that architectural look, which helps with the fire. Yeah. It's, it's almost not even, not even over-engineered. It just, it's just not efficient, really. Like, you know, to match these column sizes, they've gone wide and then they end up with such a shallow beam that they're just not really performing that well. So, yeah, it's... it's yeah. But that seems to be quite common now. You see more and more buildings where they're trying to have... The architects love the look of having a flush column and flush beam face. So it pushes your beams quite wide. Well, if you look at... Uh... As you know, like concrete buildings, office buildings, you've got the concept of a band beam as well, right? So like the, in terms of uh, saving on material, it's probably the worst option, but yeah, getting those floor to floor, yeah. um, floor to ceiling heights as low as possible is, is also a bit of a goal. Yeah.